Dr. J. Craig Venter and fellow scientists have been on a journey of discovery that will be taking science another step forward today. This adventure began as Dr. Craig Venter and his team of scientists decoded the genome of the first free-living organism, the bacterium Haemophilus influenzae. The next historical leap came as the human genome was decoded and published in February 2001 in the journal Science. The genomes of the fruit fly, mouse, and rat were soon to follow. Today, we show you how the J. Craig Venter Institute is applying genomic advances to the environment on a grand scale. Life on Earth. We all reside on a single exceptional planet that can sustain life because of complex biological systems that are working together. It is these biological systems that seem to be of particular interest to Dr. Venter. When we finished sequencing the human genome, we were looking for ways uh, to try new fields that we thought would have the, the most impact on uh, our future, the future of humanity, and obviously looking at the environment was the most important. And I decided to do an experiment showing that we could actually assemble multiple species genomes uh, together uh, from a mixture to try this on a larger scale of the ocean. Take a deeper look at our oceans, the tiny microscopic organisms, or microbes, would be studied. Microbes are important because they make up a huge amount of the life on Earth, even though in your day-to-day -day life you never see them. They're too small to be seen. So microbes and viruses constitute perhaps half the biomass of the world. In fact, the tools for understanding and examining these organisms have only recently become available in the past 20, 30 years. In 2003, whole environment shotgun sequencing was tested in the Sargasso Sea near Bermuda. This area, thought to be a virtual desert, was chosen for this first attempt. I remember very well the first meeting that we had to discuss these data, and I was overwhelmed, uh, not only by the amount of data, but by the number of new things that were there. Uh, one might have expected that, but we've had this view of the ocean as being a very simple system, and it just wasn't that way. This newfound success sent the Venter Institute into a global exploration of the unseen. Welcome aboard the Sorcerer II, a 95-foot sailing vessel equipped to carry a crew of five expedition scientists in sampling gear around the globe. We started with uh, the notion of sampling every 200 miles, actually based on the first and the last major uh, sailing expeditions, uh, the Challenger expedition sampled the bottom of the ocean every 200 miles around the globe. Also, there was Darwin's expedition that was the major driving force in his thinking about evolution. Uh, I've also been a lifetime sailor, and uh, combining sailing with science and putting all this together, it was, uh, th there was no choice. In order to filter seawater throughout the world, the Institute needed to obtain the proper permits for each country sampled. The team that you had at the Venter Institute, led by Carl Heidelberg, would communicate with the local scientists and the local governments with our uh, State Department in getting all the permits ready for us to sample. So when we, when we pulled into a port, we were legal to sample. Uh, and not only that, we had a good idea from the communications from the local scientists back to the team at the Venter Institute where we should sample. These people have been doing research in their specific area for years and years and years, so no one knows better where to sample than these people. And being able to go to really hot spots of science that people, not just us, will be interested in, but the local community and scientific community are going to be very interested in the data, so the collaboration will be used for them for years to come. The Sorcerer 2 crew is slowing the vessel to pick up a sample while Dr. Vinter and Jeff Hoffman prepare the sampling gear. 200 liters of water is being pumped on board. Then the tiny microbes are filtered out. And viral concentrates, nutrient samples, and water preserved for microscopy are stored with the appropriate buffers. They are then frozen on board while awaiting the return to the United States. The samples are greeted at the lab by researchers using the latest technology, compute power, and analysis to begin to decipher the complexities of life's code. What can this mean for our future? The ultimate goal of, the whole, of this whole project would be to understand the oceans and the biology and of those oceans, how the microbes help to influence our planet. So the, these microbes created the atmosphere that we breathe, they are continuously processing nutrients, sunlight, converting that into energy, into chemical energy that other organisms then eat. 
and that's, a, that's absolutely vital. It's the cornerstone, it's the foundation of our life on Earth. Going forward, I think uh, we'll continue to see this tremendous amount of diversity. Um, I, you know, will be discovering lots more no novel families. Who knows, families that might have uh, implications for, uh, you know, alternative energy uh, research. Um, and uh, who knows, cures for various diseases perhaps, but that, that remains to be seen. Huge discovery engine for us going forward, and it, and it helps us to understand protein structure, protein function, and protein evolution. Those fields will never be the same after this data is released. A way of starting something by gathering a huge data set and making it available. But the really scary thing is that all of this was virtually one size sample. All the rest of those samples are waiting to be analyzed, the other sizes. Who knows what mysteries are waiting there. That, um, it's, it's an amazing event to have now a set of genes going to the public databases that is larger than all the genes that have been seen in history. You look at that and people are going to be studying this data and mining this data for um, decades to come. I think it's, it's just a gold mine and it's a huge gift to the scientific community. We're learning our primary limitation is our imagination. Uh, any child can now go take a cup of seawater and we can now make more discoveries in that cup than people made in the previous couple of decades of science. Uh, so we're just at the earliest stages and hopefully this work will stimulate other people's imaginations uh, to take us to places that I can't even imagine.